welcome you to week eight now. It's only a nine-week series, but we're in week eight of our series called Belief in the Age of Skepticism. It's a series that's all about communicating the truth of Christianity in a way to build your faith. And uh, we've been looking at core beliefs of the Christian faith, loosely using something called the Apostles' Creed as an outline, the, the Apostles' Creed being the, the earliest summary of biblical doctrine that we have. And if you, get, if you read through the Apostles' Creed, at the very end you'll get to a phrase that says, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And what that phrase is talking about is the end of history. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And not surprisingly, the book that deals most uh, squarely with that topic also happens to be at the end of the Bible itself. That's the book of Revelation. And so we're going to be in, in two passages in Revelation today. That's Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6, and then chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And what we're going to be looking at is a revelation given by God to his servant, John the Apostle, uh, at the, basically the finale of human history. And with any luck, this should be, hands down, the most hopeful message in this series. <clears throat> it's Revelation chapter 21. We'll read verses 1 through 6 and then hop over to chapter 22. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer, because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the broad street of the city. The tree of life was on both sides of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is God's word. <clears throat> The passage that we're looking at today is, is primarily about one thing, and that thing is hope. And that really is central to uh, the entire book of Revelation in general, which is a really important thing to hang on to, because I think more so with Revelation than any other book in the Bible, there's a tendency to approach the book of Revelation in, in more of an academic way, in almost a purely academic way, where you, you kind of just say, you know, this is so interesting, this is so fascinating, there's all these images, and we try to, you know, gather around it and try to figure out what does this really mean, and who's the Antichrist, and is there going to be barcodes on people's foreheads, and what's that thing with the face of a woman like a locust and the tail of a scorpion, and kind of sounds like an Apache helicopter, and everybody's got a different theory about what these things are. It's just important to note, whenever you're approaching any text in the book of Revelation, that of course it's interesting, and of course it's fascinating, but that's not the purpose that John wrote it for. The primary purpose John, the author of Revelation, uh, had in mind in writing this letter was to give hope to people who were getting ready to experience more pain and suffering than anybody who listens to this teaching will likely experience in your life. Because this letter was written towards the end of the first century, and at the end of the first century, the Roman emperor Domitian was the first Roman emperor to begin the widespread, large-scale, systematic persecution of Christians. And during that time, this lasted for about 250 years, during that time, Christians had their homes confiscated, they were brought into the arenas and torn apart by wild animals, 
They were covered in pitch and burned alive. They were crucified. And many, if not most of them, had to experience and witness terrible things done to people that they loved before they died themselves. And so I say that to say that John did not write this letter to fascinate them. He wrote this letter to give them hope because hope is the only thing that is worth anything when you're dealing with that kind of pain and suffering and difficulty. And when you talk about hope, to me, one of the most important statements in the entire Bible that has to do with hope comes from the hand of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5. This is a statement that's always caught my eye, where in Romans 5, Paul is writing to Christians about the hope that we have in Jesus, and he says, this hope will not disappoint us. That implies at least two things that we're wise to consider today. Number one, that there are all kinds of hopes. Paul did not speak and write to Christians as though we were the only group of people on the planet who have hope because Paul knew, and the Bible certainly teaches, that every human being has their hope in something. The human heart is a hope-generating machine that cannot help but rest the hope of its existence on something. There are all kinds of hopes. But the other thing, maybe more importantly, that that phrase communicates is that there is such a thing as a hope that will disappoint you. And so what John, the author of Revelation, was doing with this letter was he was trying to give the people that he was writing to a hope that would not disappoint them. And for all my history buffs listening, this might interest you, it is a plain fact of history that this letter did its job. Because not only did these early church followers of Jesus, not only did they survive over 200 years of the persecution that I just described, but on the other side of that, Christianity actually transformed the empire that was trying to destroy it. It's a, it's a plain fact of history. In the year 380, Roman Emperor Theodosius declared Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, which for the record, I don't even think was a good thing for Christianity, but the point is Christianity did not transform Rome with a sword. They didn't have a sword in their hands. They didn't have power. The, the, the primary way that Christianity grew in credibility and grew in influence is as the neighbors of people who were Christians saw the way that the Christians handled death and difficulty and pain and loss and suffering because they did so in a way that, that they'd never seen before. Because again, extra biblical records confirmed it's a fact of history that when Christians were led into the arenas to die in excruciating, gruesome ways, they sang hymns. And again, it is, it's a plain fact of history confirmed by extra-biblical records, by, by non-Christian authors, that when plagues swept through the ancient cities of the Roman Empire, Christians were the ones who stuck around to care for the sick and the dying, even though that, that meant that they would likely die themselves and often did. And, and the community of Jesus' followers, among other things, were known for being the only community that was known for serving and loving and praying for and forgiving the very people who were devoted to destroying them. And when their neighbors in the Roman Empire looked on and saw that, the question was, how on earth is that possible? And the answer, biblically speaking, is not difficult. The answer is that they had a hope that did not disappoint them. And it's found in the passages that we're looking at today. And so before we get into what their hope was and what our hope is in Jesus, let me just ask you, Really three questions. First off, what are you experiencing right now? Because in my experience, people have a whole lot more that they're carrying around coming into a Sunday morning than maybe anybody else realizes. I'm sure that there's people here today that are dealing with some genuinely heavy problems. But even if not, let me ask you a follow-up question. What do you think you're likely to deal with and come across throughout the course of your life? Obviously, that's a difficult question to answer, but I I can promise you that you will deal with at least this. One thing that every single person who listens to this teaching will deal with throughout the course of your life is the end of your life. That's the great equalizer. Every one of us is eventually going to have to deal with our own mortality. And so in light of those two questions, here's the third and final one I'll ask before we begin. Do you have the kind of hope that has the legs to carry you through everything that you'll experience in this life? Because this passage will show you a hope that can do that, that can carry you through anything you experience in this life, even beyond the walls of this life. It's found here. 
Uh, and so we're going to take a look at, 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 at what that hope is. We're going to uh, end by talking about how we can lay hold of that hope so that we can be transformed, transformed by it the way the first recipients of this letter were. But before we do that, just a brief, um, brief word about the letter of Revelation in general because I think it requires a little bit of an introduction. Revelation, you may have heard this before, is what's known as apocalyptic literature, which is actually difficult to define. People have a tendency to define that differently, but everybody knows it when they see it because one of the hallmarks of apocalyptic literature is that it's full, it's, it's, it's full of extremely deliberately vivid images. And so in the passages that we looked at today, you know, just off the top of my head, what, what, we're, what we're talking about is a lamb who's also a king, a river that flows from a throne, a tree whose leaves provide healing to the nations, in a city that's wearing a wedding dress. That's what apocalyptic literature is like. And the reason for the imagery is, is to convey uh, the kind of full-orbed, multidimensional nature of the hope that we're talking about today. And what I want to do uh, during the time that we have together, you, you could probably spend a year in these passages alone, but I want to just look at three of the symbols that God revealed to John the Apostle here uh, and how they paint a picture of the hope that people who put their trust in Jesus have waiting for them at the end of all things. And I'll tell you what, what the, 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 three, um, the three aspects of this hope are. This, this passage holds out for you the hope of, number one, a perfect community. Number two, personal beauty. Number three, a fantastic reality. And we're going we're gonna to take some time walking through all three of these. Number one, what this passage shows us is the hope of a perfect community. And I want to look at just the first half of verse two here. It says, I also saw the holy city... New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. <clears throat> so what's happening here is John the Apostle is getting a vision of the end of history, and, and here's the finale that God shows him. It's not individual Christians descending from heaven. Uh, it's not a, a farmland descending from heaven. It's not a suburb descending from heaven. It's a city. So you, you ask the question, well, what exactly is a city, and why is that significant? Uh, again, cities are difficult to, to define, but probably the best defini de definition that we have is a city is simply a, a mass of people who are living and working and playing and eating and creating, and they're doing all those things uh, in close proximity to one another. That's what makes a city a city. That's exactly what John sees here, and I just want to point out before we continue, uh, because maybe somebody's already thinking this, that that does not sound like everyone's definition of heaven. Uh, so bear with me for just a moment here. The, the reason I, you know, when you hear city, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who say, you know, I could never live in a city. City life's not really my thing. The reason for that is because uh, in this life, um, cities can be very difficult places to live. It, you know, I was just talking to somebody at the end of the second service last week who was telling me this very thing, that ahead of the pandemic, they... Um, they moved into a city, and almost as soon as they put their name on the dotted line, they, they pretty much instantly had buyer's remorse, and they were talking to their agent about, man, is there any way that I can get out of this? And they wound up having to live there for a year, and then they moved back out of the city into Anne Arundel County. And what they were saying represents this really, really interesting dynamic that you'll see that on the one hand, cities are, are exciting and they have a certain draw to them, uh, while at the same time, cities can also be exhausting, difficult, and downright dangerous places to live. Uh, and and um, really, the Bible tells us exactly why both of those things can be true at the same time uh, in the book of Genesis. Because in Genesis, the very first two chapters, uh, really the first three chapters, lay out the human condition exceptionally well, which I think that in and of itself is a great uh, you know, for those that aren't really sure that the Bible's inspired or reliable, just the first three chapters, I think, will tell you more about yourself than is possible if people were just making this up thousands of years ago. Because what the Bible will tell you about you, first and foremost, in the first two chapters of God's Word, is that you were made in the image of a relational God, and therefore you have, as a part of who you are, you have a deep need for relationship, not just with God, but with other people. I don't care how introverted you claim to be, every single human being requires uh, relationships with other people. But in, in Genesis chapter 3, what we're also told immediately after that is that ever since sin has come into the world, what sin has done is it has made those relationships that we are designed to need themselves so often sources of pain, pain, 
uh, and, and frustration and, and on occasion even trauma. And so that right there in just the first three chapters of God's word lays out the human condition in a way that I think perfectly explains uh, why people on the one hand would be drawn to cities, yet at the same time would be sort of repelled by cities. It's because on the one hand, by our design, we need to be in close proximity, not just physically, but emotionally and psychologically. We need to be close to other people. And yet, all of us are so banged up by sin that the relationships that we enter into with other people are often sources of pain. And so what, what, what happens is so many people wind up going through life with this kind of debilitating loneliness where they find themselves maybe going from community to community or relationship to relationship, always looking for this community and this relationship that they can never quite seem to find. And I'm just wondering, perhaps, maybe somebody listening to this right now would say, yeah, that kind of does sound like the story of my life. Uh, C.S. Lewis um, captures, in a really helpful way, what it is that we're looking for, according to God's word, uh, toward the end of one of his books in in the Narnia Chronicles. Lewis, obviously being a Christian himself, uh, was heavily influenced by what he read in in God's word, and he derived a lot of his inspiration from the Bible. And um, towards the end of one of his books, I don't know if you've ever read these, I actually went through the, the Narnia Chronicles for the first time in the summer of 2020, But towards the end of the Narnia Chronicles, uh, in the book Prince Caspian, there's this huge battle, and it looks like, you know, the forces of good are going to lose, but then thankfully along comes um, Aslan, the Jesus lion, who does what Aslan does in every one of those stories, which is turns everything around and saves the day. And so when he does so, the world begins to heal, and there's this celebration, and there's this feast, and everybody gathers around a fire, and I remember the first time I I read what I'm about to read you... uh, It was so moving to me, I started getting emotional because what he writes down really speaks to this longing that the Bible says is is, is deeply embedded in every single human heart. Here's exactly how he described this celebration. It says, the best thing of all about this feast was that there was no breaking up or going away. But as the talk grew quieter and slower, one after another would begin to nod and finally drop off to sleep. I love this part with feet toward the fire and good friends on either side. Till at last there was silence all around the circle and the chattering of water over stone at the fort of Baruna could be heard once more. The first thing that he says here, that he said was the best thing about this feast, he says the best part of, of it all was that there was no breaking up and there was no going away. And I just want to point out to you you have never experienced a celebration like that, and you never will in this life. Let me walk through that. Uh, A couple of weeks ago on on, um, New Year's Eve uh, was my daughter's birthday. My daughter turned six years old, and that was a happy day. You know, nothing went sideways. Everything went according to plan. It was great. It was perfect. It was beautiful. But I want to tell you, and I think you'll understand this as I walk through it, that as great as that day was, as happy as that day was, there was just an undercurrent of sorrow that I really couldn't shake, that we can't ever shake. And I remember I was sitting on the couch with with my daughter, and I had my arms around her, and I was loving on her, and I told her, out, you know, I was saying, man, Scarlett, that's so amazing, you're six years old. And I said, you know, because in just two more periods of six years, which, you know, like every parent tried to warn me, but I didn't listen because I thought I knew better, six years gone like that. And I was telling Scarlett, I was saying, man, in just two more six-year periods of time, you know how old you're going to be? You're going to be 18 years old, and you're going to be an adult, and you're going to be thinking of carving out a you know, life for yourself and getting out in the world and moving out of my house and all this kind of stuff. My wife, Katie, overheard me saying this, broke down crying immediately and said, stop it, we are not doing that today. <laughs> and, and so I was, you know, I, I zipped it for her sake. But, but I just want to tell you, that's what every celebration this side of, a turn, this side of heaven is like. It, it, you know, it's great to celebrate my kids' birthdays, but I know that with every one of those birthdays, they're growing up and I'm growing old. Right? And every, every celebration you've ever been to, no matter how great it is, every gathering you've ever been a part of, no matter how happy it was, every relationship you've ever been a part of, no matter how deeply satisfying that marriage or that family dynamic or that friendship was to you, what all of those have in common, I'm not trying to be a downer here, I'm trying to be a realist, what every one of those have in common is that they will end. To quote Lewis here, what they all have in common is that one day there will be breaking up, 
There will be going away. And please believe me when I say I'm not trying to be morbid. I just think it's really important to think about this. I've heard it pointed out that when you sit around a table with your closest friends or your family members, as much as we try to ignore this reality, here is the plain fact of human existence on this side of eternity. One person at that table is going to live to see every other person at that table die. And what Lewis is talking about here with that, with that goofy little quote from the kid's book that I happen to enjoy a lot as an adult is he's saying this never-ending feast that's a celebration uh, with, with I, I just love that imagery, your feet are toward the fire and your friends and your family and the people that you love and the people who love you are on either side of you and there's no undercurrent of sorrow because it's never going to go away. There's no expiration date. There's no goodbye. It's just, it's love without parting. The the human heart is designed to need that. By God's imprint on our DNA, we we are designed for love without parting. And what the Bible is saying here is that in heaven, that's exactly what you'll have. In heaven, what's waiting for you in Jesus is a community where all relationships are what your relationships were always meant to be. And they'll be marked by celebration, and they'll be marked by feasting, and they'll be marked by friends and, and family and loved ones on either side, and it's, it's never going to be taken from you. And so I just want to tell you that whatever you think about cities right now, this city that John saw at the end of human history, this is the city that you were made to be a part of, that you were made to be a citizen of. And through Jesus, that city is your city. So the first aspect of this hope is, number one, the hope of a perfect community. And we just looked at the first half of the first verse of this revelation here. Secondly, the second aspect of this hope that we see is, number two, the hope of personal beauty. And now what I want to do is read uh, verse two in its entirety. Because it says, I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, And it says, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And so suddenly here, what we're seeing is that this city is actually a bride, but John did not see a bride in general because he said this is a bride adorned for her husband. In other words, what what this is talking about and what this is calling you to think about when you read these words is a bride in her wedding dress on her wedding day, which is incredibly significant, and I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, recently, <coughs> we have had, and I'm super happy about this, a number of pretty decent snows. And I realize that not everybody likes snow as much as I do, but I do. And I don't have any logical reason that I love snow. It just immediately puts me in a good mood. And a couple of weeks ago, weeks ago I think it was a Monday, we had a, a snow that, that dumped, I think it was six or seven inches. And I, um, I have a Jeep Wrangler, and so I drove it into the office. I was the only one that made it in that day because... That's the whole reason you buy a Jeep. You're not going to use it then. So I I came here, and from our parking lot, actually, I did this goofy little Instagram video where I explained one of the reasons that snowfall is just, you know, I like it so much. And and what I said in that video, if you saw it, was was that snow, this is one of the unique things about this particular weather pattern that I think only snow can really do. Snow has this unique way, and I think this points to the gospel, as you'll see in a moment. Sorry to spiritualize the weather, but I'm a pastor. That's what I do. Snow has this unique way of making absolutely anything beautiful. You ever notice that? You can dump a blanket of snow on the ugliest landscape in the world. I mean, it can be full of broken down cars and dead trees and dilapidated buildings and whatever. You put a blanket of snow on that and instantly it is a work of art. It is breathtakingly beautiful. And I say that because wedding, wedding gowns were actually designed with that same principle in mind. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor. I feel like I can speak with authority here. I've been to a number of weddings, and I will tell you, there is not a bride on planet Earth who does not look absolutely breathtaking on her wedding day and her wedding gown. And every single time I'm standing at the altar with the groom, and we look, and the bride squares up on me and walks you know, down the aisle, everybody in every congregation I've ever officiated, it's the same thing. All eyes on the bride, it's, it's breathtaking, you can hear a pin drop, except for the sniffles because people are crying at the beauty of it. And that's the thing about wedding dresses, that even if you don't like what you look like, 
You know, even if you didn't get into the shape that, that, that you wanted to get into or get down to the specific weight that you wanted to get down to, which whoever does, I mean, nobody actually has the physical appearance that they want. The point is, a wedding dress doesn't need that because a wedding dress does not depend on the beauty that you have. It gives you a beauty that doesn't depend on you. Now, in saying that, I just want to say you have to understand that because what John is doing with this metaphor, he's talking about God's people descending from heaven to this earth. When he's talking about a bride adorned for her husband, he's inviting you to consider a beauty that's given to you that doesn't depend on you. And this is almost a deliberate reference to what Paul had to say in Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul is commanding husbands how to love their wives. He tells husbands to love your wives just like Jesus loves his wife, his bride, the church. And then he goes on and he explains how Jesus loves us. In, in Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, it says, Jesus gave himself for us, his bride, verse 26, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Jesus didn't give himself for us because we were holy. It's his sacrifice that makes us holy. And he goes on and he says, Jesus did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. Again, Jesus did not uh, give himself for us because he found us beautiful. It is his sacrifice. It is his initiating love that actually makes us beautiful. That's the gospel right there, and that is the polar opposite of what you will find in literally any other belief system. And so what the Bible teaches is that the moment you give your life to Jesus, you are just like a, a landscape that's been covered uh, in fresh fallen snow or like a bride on her wedding day, you are covered with a beauty that does not depend on whatever beauty you'd accrued for yourself. And when God the Father looks at you, regardless of what you think of yourself, regardless of how you feel about yourself, in Jesus, he sees a masterpiece. In Jesus, he sees you as breathtaking. In Jesus, he sees you as, as beautiful. Now, in, in saying that, you know, this is, this is the reality of the Christian life, you know, at least in my experience personally, maybe you can say amen to this, we very rarely feel like that. You know, like our self-perception subjectively very rarely, if ever, catches up to what Scripture says is true about us objectively, meaning in this life we still struggle with shame. We still struggle with wondering what other people think about us. We still struggle with feeling like we have to hide or we have to prove or we have to achieve to try to make up for this kind of deep-seated feeling that we're inadequate or we couldn't pass scrutiny because we're in the process of actually becoming what Jesus has already declared us to be. And I, I love the way that a, a, an Irish theologian, I came across this quote a few years ago, Irish theologian named Alec Modier put it this way. He said, we are called to become what we are. This is the mighty imperative of Christian ethics. Every other ethical system calls us to the costly effort of becoming what we are not. But in the full salvation already bequeathed to us in Christ, the new nature is already ours, waiting for expression and poised for growth. He said, right at the front end there, he said, we are called to become what we are. Now, that's a lifelong process that begins the moment you give your life to Jesus that the Bible refers to as your sanctification. And anybody who's walked with Jesus for any length of time knows that that process is full of ups and downs, it's full of peaks and valleys, and, and it's often discouraging when you sometimes painfully find out, oh, I, I guess I'm not as far along in this process as I thought I was or hoped I would be. However, this is what John is seeing here. John is seeing that one day that process in your life will be complete. What this means is that one day there will be, I don't know, maybe this only means something to me because of my temperament or Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or that and a whole bunch of other things. But I'm, you know, I have a tendency, if I get a 99 on a test, I don't think about the 99 I got right. It's that one that I got wrong that haunts me. Maybe because I'm an Enneagram one or a firstborn or whatever it is. But the point is, I've always had a tendency to be really hard on myself. And when people have spoken into my life, you know, they've, they've tried to rid me of that. I'm a work in progress. That's why what I'm about to say means so much to me. And maybe if, if that's you, it is going to mean so much to you. What John is seeing here is that one day there's not going to be any gap between what Jesus has declared you to be and who you really are. Meaning there's not going to be any more shame in your life at all. And that anxiety that comes from feeling like you have to prove something or you have to hide something or you have to achieve in order to be a valuable, worthwhile person, that's going to lose its grip on you forever. 
And in that moment, you will be as beautiful, you will be as perfect, you will be as glorious as a bride on her wedding day. And in saying that, I got a little bit of a smirk right now because I know that's a weird thing for the men in the audience to visualize. (laughs) But I think, all jokes aside, there's a reason that, that this is how Scripture, you know, refers to not just God's daughters, but God's people. Meaning men are called to think about this as difficult as it might be for them, which I think is incredibly important because I'll tell you something, this is what I've learned in 10 years of meeting with men one-on-one and having them open up to me in a way that, you know, people have a tendency to get a little bit more honest with their pastor than than other people. Here's what I've learned in 10 years. Men deal with shame a lot more than they let on. Men deal with feelings of inadequacy, of feeling like, you know, they're a failure of feeling like they have to constantly work, like life's on a treadmill. I think everybody deals with that. But I've noticed that men deal with that more than other men tend to think because they have a tendency to not think about it. And I say all that to say this picture of what you are going to be like in Jesus, this vision that God gave his disciple, his apostle John, this is the polar opposite of shame. This is perfect, sinless, righteous, glorious beauty. One day, that's going to be you. And so secondly, what we see here is is a hope of personal beauty. But thirdly, and the last aspect of this hope that we're going to talk about this morning is the hope of a fantastic reality. The reason I I, I like all three aspects of this hope because one of them has to do with the relationships that you'll have. One One of them has to do with you personally. But this last one has to do with the world. And you read about this in verses three and four. It says, then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look. God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. This final image gets to really one of the major themes of, of, of what the Bible has to say about heaven, and it's actually one of the things that uh, I think we tend to get wrong the most frequently when we think or talk about heaven. Because, because you notice here, if, if you pay attention to the, to the verbiage, and it's very specific and it's very important, John did not see in his vision of the end, God did not show John individual Christians floating up to heaven and escaping the big bad world. What God showed John was heaven descending down to this world and transforming this world. And and what this world will one day be transformed into is the world that you and I have always longed to live in. And I actually want to go a step further here and make a strong statement that what the Bible is saying the world is going to be transformed into is a world that that at least a part of you knows you you were designed for. It's not just, I really want it. It's a part of you knows, no, that's what it was always supposed to be. <clears throat> so a, a, an author, a very famous author named J.R.R. Tolkien, who you probably heard before, he was the, um, he was the author of The Lord of the Rings. Um, he, he wrote, I heard this reference a number of times, and I finally read it a couple of months ago. He wrote about a 40-page essay called On Fairy Stories. And in this essay, he was talking about, when he referenced fairy stories, he was talking about what, what we mean when we talk about just general fantasy today, which before Tolkien, it's amazing, there really wasn't a lot of fantasy. And then, you know, today, after he wrote The Lord of the Rings, uh, any bookstore, that's one of the largest sections you're going to find. He's kind of seen as like the architect of modern high fantasy. And anyway, in this, in this essay that he wrote called On Fairy Stories, uh, he says that all, all good fantasy, all genuine you know, authentic, legitimate fantasy. It has a number of themes in common. Every one of the stories will cover, uh, you know, several different themes. And among them, he talks about, you know, escaping from death, being able to step outside the bounds of time and escaping from death and the law of entropy and all that. Another one of them is the ability to have love without parting. We talked about that earlier, a love that you know you're never going to have to lose. But then thirdly and, and, and finally, One thing that every legitimate fantasy story has to have in common uh, is that there has to be the theme of good finally triumphing over evil. And he said that 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 literature, it has this way of, of, of drawing out something in the human heart in a way that really nothing else can. And he made, you know, during his lifetime, he was kind of 
uh, writing around the times of the world wars when humanity was basically showing, you know, the evils that it was capable of, he made a really bold prediction. And he said that no matter how advanced modern civilization became, no matter how civilized or mature, you know, people believed they were, he said that our hunger for fantasy, for those kinds of stories, would never go away. And here we are several decades later, and daggone if he has not been proved right. Because even today, you can look at the way that people flock to fantasy stories, either, you know, in books, but also in movies. I mean, you look at just the success of the Marvel franchise proves how badly we want to escape into a world with those themes that he talked about. You look at how all these years later, people are still reading The Lord of the Rings or watching it. They're still reading The Chronicles of Narnia. They're still reading, you know, Harry Potter or whatever the latest book is going to be. They're, they're, they're still trying to escape into those worlds which is such a fascinating thing to consider because as, as modern people, as civilized people, we know that that's not what life is like. We know that, that the real world isn't like that, and yet we can't help but dive into those worlds and allow ourselves to be taken by those worlds, and we find those so consoling. And the, the reason for that, Tolkien said, is because what, we have what's called a memory trace in our souls, meaning, meaning that no matter what you claim to believe, whether you're a religious or a secular person, whatever it is, that there's a part of us that knows when we read those stories and we see those themes, it's not just, oh, those are so great or those are so happy or those are so appealing, that there's a part of the human heart that knows that, that, that that's not just a consoling thought, that's the way things were always meant to be. That when we look around at the world as it is now on this side, you know, sandwiched between Genesis chapter 3 and heaven, we don't just look around and say, oh man, it's a shame that things are the way that we are. When we look at oppression, when we look at the way that people treat each other, when we look at the fact that every love relationship is going to end in death somehow, you don't just see that and say that's unfortunate. You look at that and you say, no, this is not the world that we were meant for. That there's a part of us that knows that we were designed to live in a world where there is no death. And we're designed to live in a world where there's love without parting. And we're designed to live in a world where good finally triumphs over evil. And what John is saying here is that through Jesus, that's the way the world will one day be. That's what he's describing here. The world that you and I, a world that's infinitely better than that, than that feeling we get when we get pulled into those stories momentarily. He's describing here a world where, where, where you personally will walk with God the way you were designed to in the garden. Where, there, where God himself will wipe away every tear from your eyes, where there is no grief, there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is no hurting, love without parting and life without end, a fantastic reality. That's the hope that Jesus stands ready to offer anybody who puts their trust in him. Now, we could, we could spend so much more time on just these three images or we could look at everything else that this passage deals with but in the interest of not preaching an incredibly long sermon today, I want to answer the question now, how do you actually take hold of this hope in a way that it, it changes you? Because I said on the front end of this teaching, it's a fact of history that the original recipients of this letter, when they understood this hope, this hope, it, it wasn't just something that they laid hold of. This hope laid hold of them and it allowed them to face absolutely anything. So the question is, how can you make this hope your own? And I want to offer you three answers to that question. There's three things that we need to understand about this hope if we, really, if we want to actually be carried through life by it. We need to understand first the nature of this hope, secondly the availability of this hope, and lastly, the last thing we'll cover is the cost of this hope. So let me, as quickly as I can, just run through all three of those. Number one, we need to understand the nature of this hope. <clears throat> In verse 4, we just looked at this. It said, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer. Now, obviously, in saying that those things will no longer exist, it's implying, and you all know this, those things exist now. Grief and crying and pain and death and sadness is a part of the world as we know it. And so verse 4 is talking about a hope that is squarely and entirely in the future. But you read just one verse further in verse 5, and it says something that might surprise you. Verse 5 says, Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, not I will make everything new, but I am making everything new. That's present tense. And so what we're being told here is that on the one hand, this hope is not yet, but on the other hand, uh, this hope to some degree is already happening now. 
And what that means, if you just walk back through the three ideas that we covered this morning, what that means is that, yes, one day you will have perfect relationships. However, it's, it's vitally important that we don't let go of the fact that when the Holy Spirit enters into your life, you can experience supernatural healing in your relationships even here and even now, as I'm sure a number of people listening to this teaching can attest in their own life. Similarly, on the other side of eternity, you will be perfectly, gloriously beautiful, rid of any stain of sin whatsoever. That's a great thought you know, to remind yourself of, but it's important in doing that to remember that when the Holy Spirit of God enters your life, the Holy Spirit will transform your conduct and your character in super, in, you know, breaking habits and liberating you in supernatural ways right here and right now in this life that would never otherwise be possible. We're foolish to, to overlook that. And similarly, there will come a day when the world will be perfectly filled with love and joy and peace and dancing and singing and feasts and celebration and all that, which is a lovely thought. But we should remember that we can experience a foretaste of that even here and even now through the power of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit mediates the presence of God in a way that, you know, that peace that passes understanding, that joy that lifts you through the circumstances and situation God walks you through. I've experienced that many times in my life. I'm sure you have as well. And, and this is why I, I think it's brilliant the way that the New Testament, one of the ways it describes the Holy Spirit is it calls the Holy Spirit a down payment. Because what happens when you give your life to Jesus and you're filled with the Holy Spirit is a process begins in your life that one day will be paid in full. That process begins with the assurance that one day it will be complete. And this is why people have called the Christian hope a hope that is both already but not yet at the same time. So, so let's ask the question, how does that, you know, maybe you're thinking, hey, fascinating, but how does that actually help me deal with what I have to deal with on Monday morning? And I believe that what we're talking about here, this concept if you can really work this into your own life and grasp this, this is one of the most practically useful concepts for you and I to get, you know, wrap our heads around um, that'll allow us to face anything. Because on the one hand, we're looking forward to this beautiful future, yet we're realistic about the fact that it's not here yet. And so Christian hope is both, it's a strange thing to say, but it's both pessimistic and optimistic at the same time. It's, it's, it's realistic and idealistic at the same time. Let me tell you a personal story about how this works. If you were a, a part of this church a little over a month ago, you probably heard me complaining about the fact that my wife, who's a NICU nurse for the hospital, had her vehicle stolen out of the hospital parking garage while she was working uh, an overnight shift, which, believe it or not, I kind of took issue with, had a little bit of a problem with that. And I remember when I, when, I told, when I told my daughter Scarlett, I sat her down because she was asking where the car was. And I was saying, all right, let's, just, let's, let's have this conversation. And I, I remember I told her, I said, Scarlett, somebody stole our car. And she was speechless. She gasped, and there was, a, <laughs> there was a moment of silence. And she said, you mean without asking? And I said, <laughs> yes. And I said, Scarlett, that's about the size of it. That's what we're dealing with. Didn't even ask. Let me just walk you through my, my kind of like how I process this. It, um, it burned me the more I thought about, like if you're going to steal a car, I get it. Steal a car. But from a hospital parking garage, that means that whoever stole my wife's car knew that he was stealing this vehicle from one of two kinds of people. He was either stealing this car from somebody who was providing medical care for people who needed it or from a person who themselves needed medical care. That's who you're stealing that car from. Great. But even on top of that, and this one, this one bothered me even more, that the vehicle my wife drove to the hospital that night had all four of our kids' car seats in it. Yeah. So when he was wheeling down the road, he knew that whoever he stole that car from, first off, they had four young kids that now they could not transport because he stole the car. And when police found it, he had dumped the car seats. And he, what, like you had four buddies rolling around in a stolen Sequoia? No, you just got rid of my wife's car seats. I thought about that, and I, I wish I could tell you that I handled that with total poise and aplomb, but I'm not that far, you know. I, I, Jesus isn't done with me, thank God. I'm just not that far yet. But I will tell you that it's situations like that where my Christian faith, and specifically this aspect of, 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 of the hope that we have, this is where this is so important. I don't know how you deal with things apart from what I'm talking about today, because my faith tells me that on the one hand, 
uh, on the one hand, this world is in desperate need of renewal. And so it, it, it shouldn't really surprise me all that much when the world proves that it is and when people who are part of this world prove that they are, or even when I myself prove that I'm in desperate need of renewal. But my Christian faith also tells me that one day this world will be renewed, which gives me something to hold on to. And, and, and so, you know, not, not that we got our car back and it's fine, and please, that is not what suffering is. There's people listening to this. You've been through so much more than losing your car for a couple weeks. I, I get it, but, but let me just say this. A lot of times when people go through stuff like that, you'll hear the phrase, I know you've heard this before, you know, I've lost my faith in humanity. And I'll just tell you this, a Christian who understands a fraction of what this book is saying about us is never going to lose their hope in humanity because they're never going to have any hope in humanity. And that's what I mean when I say it's, it's pessimistic and it's realistic, but what this book also says, what we're talking about today, is one day... God is going to remove everything that's wrong from the human heart. And by grace through faith in the name of Jesus, he will make us into the community that we were all, always meant to be. That is an unfailingly optimistic and idealistic hope. And you need both of these. You need both of these. Because if all of you have is the pessimistic, then, then you're just going to be a miserable, cold, callous, cynical person through all your life. And if all you have is the optimistic angle, that's just going to make you a very naive, kind of fragile person that's completely unprepared for the brokenness of this world. You need this kind of full-orbed hope. You need to understand the nature of this already but not yet hope. So first off, we have to understand the nature of it. Two more things. These will be way shorter than that one. I just thought it was really important to get to that one. Secondly, we have to understand the availability of this hope. Look at verse 6 with me. It says, And he said to me, It is done I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. Let me, you just saw it, but let me ask the question. Who gets this hope? You know, is it people who have lived a really upstanding moral life? Is it people who have, you know, had kind of a, 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 a stoic strength through suffering and suffered well with a stiff upper lip and never doubted and never was angry at God or anything? Nothing like that. According to Jesus himself who's speaking here, there's one group of people who gets this kind of hope we've been talking about all morning. You know who it is? The thirsty. And I love that they're called the thirsty because thirsty people, all thirsty people know, all thirsty people know is how much they need a drink. Thirsty people don't have any pride. Thirsty people don't, don't, don't you know, kind of stiff arm people and say, I don't need your help. I don't need your water. I have what it takes within me to satisfy my own need for refreshment. That's not the case. Thirsty people are remarkably humble, and they know that they need something to come from outside of them to satisfy the thirst that they have. What Jesus is talking about here is it's people who are aware of their need, people who know how much they need grace, something that comes from outside of them that's freely given to them that they can't earn or merit. Those are the people who get this hope. Now, if I ended there, because I'm not ending there. If I ended there, it might come across as though, you know, God just kind of doesn't have any standards. You know, I could just live whatever life I want, and, and, and all I got to do is at the end of it, you know, throw up a Hail Mary, I'm really thirsty, and then, and then that's, you know, so God just doesn't really care. This is, that makes it look like it's really cheap grace. And that's why there's one final thing that we need to understand about this hope if we're going to be transformed by it, and that's the cost of this hope. And what you'll find when you study this passage for yourself is that this grace and this hope is, is, is free, but it is anything but cheap. In, in Revelation 22, which we didn't spend a lot of time in, in verses 1 and 3, it talks about the throne. And it refers to it the same way both times it references it. It calls it the throne of God and of the Lamb. That's talking about Jesus. But it doesn't say the throne of God and Jesus or God and the Son or God and the Savior. It says God and the Lamb which like everything else in apocalyptic literature is incredibly important imagery. Now that is a deliberate nod for my Old Testament scholars in the house. That's a deliberate nod to the book of Exodus, where if you're familiar with the story, you know that when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt and after nine plagues refused to let God's people go and committed these unspeakable atrocities against God's people, God finally said that he would send his angel of death to bring judgment on the Egyptians by killing the firstborn of every family. Now, let me, let me pause there. That would be a terrible thing to happen even today, you know, the death of a firstborn. But I, I, I want to point out that in that day, we don't really understand exactly what the firstborn represents in our culture like they would have then. Because in this day, in this traditional communal culture, the hope of the entire family rested on the firstborn. 
Meaning, the way that it worked in that day is if the firstborn was wise and strong and capable and a person of character, then the whole family would thrive. But if the firstborn wasn't, if the firstborn was a fool or they were weak or they were cowardly or whatever it was, then the whole family would wither and worst case scenario, that entire family line would die out. And so when God sent his angel of death and judged the Egyptians by killing their firstborn, he wasn't just taking their firstborn away, he was taking their hope away for the way that the Egyptians had tried to take away the hope of his chosen people, Israel, and had effectively done so for some 400 years. And, and, and with that, God spoke to his people, the Israelites, and he told them that if they would slay a lamb and they would cover the doorpost of their homes with the blood of that lamb, then what would happen is the angel of death would pass over them. That's why it was called Passover then. The angel of death would pass over them and their firstborn would not die. In other words, the way that it worked back then is the only way for their firstborn and their really functionally their hope to be preserved is if a lamb was slain. And that's what happened. That's what led to the, to the first deliverance of God's people from slavery. Now, that's an incredibly important story, but it pointed forward to a greater story like everything the Old Testament does. And centuries later, at the very beginning of John's gospel account, we read that when John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ, through revelation of God, he looked at Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what was happening in that moment is, is John, through the eyes of faith, it's like God the Father had rolled back the curtain and John could finally see, now I know what he's up to. Now I know what he's going to do. And what John understood in that moment that, that Calvary clearly shows us is that God himself would come to understand what it's like to lose a firstborn son because Jesus Christ would be the sacrificial lamb whose blood would cover the sins and protect the lives and preserve the hope of all who put their trust in him. That's the real deliverance of God's people from the ultimate slavery that kept us all in bondage. And all of that is only possible because Jesus Christ effectively took our hopelessness on himself on the cross. He took it into the grave with him and he left it there when he rose again, never to die, never to die again, so that we would have a hope that is perpetually alive because our Savior is perpetually alive. Now, I've said a whole lot today. You've arrived at the end. I just wanted to conclude our time together with a story. Uh, this story, I came across this actually when I was still in school at Moody. Uh, it it meant, meant something to me the first time I read it. It uh, means more to me now, and I'll explain why at the end. Um, but I haven't told this one in, um, in a couple of years. And, and this story is, is um, it's basically a picture of what can happen in your life and in my life as this hope really begins to take root. Um, it's the story of a man named John Harper, which if you've been a part of this church, maybe you've heard this before. But John Harper, a number of decades ago, boarded a boat with his six-year-old daughter. Uh, it's a boat that you have undoubtedly heard of. I think it's probably the most famous boat in history. It was called the Titanic. Harper had been invited to preach at the Moody Church in Chicago for three months, um, but he never lived to stand in that pulpit. And um, when, the, when the Titanic hit that iceberg and began to sink, he made sure that his daughter was placed into one of those lifeboats, and he then began what would be the final evangelistic work of his life. The survivors of that shipwreck uh, gave testimony of what his final moments were like. They said that as the, the chaos and the panic and the confusion began to set in, that you could actually hear John Harper's voice over the crowds, and he was calling out that, that women and children and those who had not given their lives to Jesus should be allowed into the lifeboats ahead of everyone else. And he himself never got on one of those lifeboats. As the boat began to sink, uh, some 1,500 people either jumped or fell into that water without a lifeboat because there were not nearly enough for all the people on the Titanic. Uh, and as they began either freezing to death or drowning, Harper could be seen swimming from person to person, preaching the gospel to them, pleading with them to give their life to Jesus before it was too late. Of those 1,500 people that entered the water without a lifeboat, only six survived. Six out of 1,500. One of those six people claimed to be John Harper's final convert. He climbed onto some debris that was floating in the water, and he looked and he saw Harper struggling in the water nearby, and Harper saw him and he called out to him, and he asked the man if he was saved, and the man said no. Harper said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
The man didn't answer him, and a moment later was taken away on a wave. A number of minutes went by. Harper was still struggling in the water, and the current brought the two back together. Harper saw him again, and again he called out to him, and he asked the man if he was saved. And again the man said no. And one last time Harper preached the gospel, and he called out and he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And with those words, he slipped under the waves for the final time. The only reason we have that, that story is because the man that Harper preached to did give his life to Jesus. And four years lady, later, he told the testimony that I'm telling you now through tears at a Titanic survivors meeting uh, in Ontario. But I, I'll, I'll tell you, the most moving part of that story for me is that when the Titanic began to sink, John Harper actually had a life jacket. And that life jacket might have saved his life. Uh, that life jacket may have allowed him to see his six-year-old daughter grow up. But he gave it away to a man who didn't have one. And when he did, he looked that man in the eye and he said, don't you worry about me because I'm not going down. I'm going up. I want to call the worship team up. We're going to close with this. That, that story um, has always been inspiring to me. It's always been moving to me. But I'll tell you that at this point in my life, that hits me harder than it ever has before because at this time in my life, just like John Harper did in that story, I have a six-year-old daughter. In the thought of not seeing her or, or my kids or my wife ever again uh, is enough to bring tears to my eyes. But that's what John Harper chose. I mean, when he gave up that life jacket, he was giving up his ability to see his daughter grow up. He was giving up his ability to see so many of the things that I take for granted in my own life because it was almost as though he was giving up his hope so that someone else could have hope. And you ask the question, where does that kind of bravery come from? Where does that kind of selflessness come from? Where does that kind of courageous sacrifice come from? And biblically speaking, that's not a difficult question to answer. Harper himself answered it when he looked that man in the eye. The reason he was able to do that, the reason he could give up his own hope is because he knew he had a hope that went beyond the walls of this world. That's the hope that John was hoping the original recipients of this letter would lay hold of. That's the hope that Jesus Christ stands ready to offer absolutely anyone who will come to him simply admitting their need for it. And the reason I told that story at the end of this teaching is, is to, to make the point that when this hope becomes real to you, when, when you both lay hold of this hope and this hope lays hold of you, it won't just make you an individually hopeful person. It will turn you into an agent of hope for the people around you because that's the thing about hope. When real hope takes root in your life, it's contagious to the people around you. And the first recipients of this letter, those first followers of Jesus that had so much pain and suffering ahead of them, they overcame what they went through, what God walked them through, not as an individual cluster of hopeful people, but as a community of hope. And that community transformed that dark and brutal hopeless Roman Empire. And it can do the same thing for us by grace through faith in the name of Jesus. And so what's, what's the application? I've said everything I've said to simply leave you here. Here's what I would leave you with today. Let the hope that Jesus offers you transform you, that it might transform someone else through you. That's it. <clears throat> That's all. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father God, I want to thank you that we have a living hope that nothing in this world can threaten. Because Jesus Christ always lives to intercede on our behalf, so our hope will always be alive. God, would you make us the kind of people that both lay hold of this hope and the kind of people that have this hope lay hold of us, that we would be able to walk through with poise and confidence and love and joy and peace, anything that we have waiting for us through this life, knowing that we have a hope beyond this life. By grace through faith, in the name of Jesus.